discussing the national budget, particularly PEP's expectations for the 2022 national budget to be presented this Friday by Finance Minister Dr. Stumbekom Sokotwane. At this point in time, allow me to uh, welcome my guest in studio. Uh, Mr. Tembo, good morning and uh, welcome to the program. Good morning, Peter. How are you? I'm um, doing fine. How are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. And uh, of course, a very good morning to the Zambian people out there. All right. I should make mention that uh, we are live on 93.3 FM. Quito FM is live on that frequency. You can get us live. Live on 87.7 on Hot FM. You can also get us live on GSTV channel 912. Or better yet, why not go to social media and uh, like our Facebook page, Hot FM Zambia. You can follow live proceedings on the Hot FM page. You can also follow live proceedings on the Quito FM page. You can send us your advanced questions to Mr. Tembo and we'll put them forward to him as per president and uh, he will respond to them later in the show. Um, Mr. Tembo, before we, you know, actually in delve into uh, issues to do with uh, national interest, first of all, uh, we've noticed that uh, you had adopted... Um, the Facebook platform or social media as a way of providing checks and balances and getting your messages across. Indeed. And uh, the past few weeks, you noticed that uh, your page has been hacked. Yes. Have you managed to retrieve your page since the day the hackers took it over? Uh, we have made a lot of efforts, but uh, we have not yet retrieved the page. So um, when you look at the process of retrieving a hacked page, you realize that uh, uh, the first thing that Facebook will ask you for is your identity document uh, so that they can verify that uh, the page in question is actually your page. Mm -hmm. And so we wrote to Facebook and we told them that our page has been hacked and uh, they requested for my ID documents, uh, which my IT guys sent to Facebook. And then what happens is that when you send those ID documents, uh, for us it was a, a passport copy. Mm. Uh, Facebook then sends that document to the country of issue to verify that it is a validly uh, issued document. Uh, so Facebook told us that uh, they've uh, sent the document uh, for verification. And uh, uh, we have been following it up for almost three weeks now. Mm. Uh, what Facebook is telling us is that they have not received any confirmation uh, regarding the document that we submitted. From the Zambian uh, government? From the Zambian uh, government, of course. Uh, mm. We assume it's the passport office. Mm. I don't know how the uh, actual intricacies of uh, government actually okay. operate. It could be the uh, passport office. It could be the, uh, you know, the OP. Mm. Uh, it, I, I don't know who actually verifies uh, uh, those uh, nationally issued uh, identity documents, like uh, the passport. Okay. Uh, but that is where the, the hold up is. And... Um, you know, now we are getting a bit frustrated and we are beginning to believe that um, this failure by government to verify my passport copy to Facebook is actually motivated by political reasons. Mm. Because um, a lot of people have had their pages hacked, actually. Um, uh, a lot of people reached out to us and they told us that they recovered their pages within a matter of days. And the process is the same, uh, Peter. They would, Facebook would request them for uh, their I identity document. And then the moment they submit, that document is sent for verification. Once that document is verified as uh, a true uh, you know, uh, issue, uh, a validly issued uh, mm -hmm. identity document, the, then the Facebook page is retrieved. Will, yes, it is retrieved. So in my particular case, um, you know, I find it very regrettable that um, uh, the government has actually failed to verify to Facebook that the copy of passport that I, you know, submitted to Facebook is a valid issue. You think this is politically motivated? Well, at the beginning, I thought it was um, because of this transition. You know, when there's a transition, there's always a bit of uh, chaos um, when there's a new government coming mm. in. But now, you know, the prolonged nature of uh, this matter is getting us worried and is making us believe that uh, this could be politically motivated, um, where, um, you know, our new government might be trying to stiff for us in terms of being able to relate with the people and being able to uh, provide the necessary checks and balances as per our job description as mm -hmm. an opposition political party. All right, speaking of the New Dawn government, uh, it's been over two months since uh, the UPND alliance was ushered into office in uh, August, uh, on August 12th, after the general pause. What would you, what would be your assessment of the New Dawn administration in government? 
Well, it, it depends on which uh, which aspect, uh, whether it's governance, uh, you know, rule of law, management of the economy. Uh, uh, there are so many um, aspects of running government. But um, if I were allowed to touch on this and that, uh, I would begin by, you know, talking about the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for us as a party, we are very disappointed with the, um, uh, the performance of the new Dawn government so far as far as adherence to the rule of law is concerned. Um, we, we, we have noted that, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hichirema's uh, government has adopted the same arrogance that we witnessed under the PF government you know, the, the total disregard of the rule of law. I'll give you a, f a few examples, uh, Peter. Um, when you look at the issue of adherence to the Constitution, uh, you realize that uh, uh, we have the same incident of, uh, you know, creating ministries without approval of uh, uh, Parliament and people report for work. That is a breach of the Constitution. We have the same incidents of contracting loans, like the World Bank loan, without approval of Parliament, which the UPND, when they were in opposition, really uh, spoke strongly against. And our expectation, not only as an opposition political party, but just as an ordinary citizen of this country, would have been that uh, when you have a new government which came into power uh, on the basis of uh, you know, providing um, uh, proper governance and uh, you know, adhering to the rule of law, and then they begin to breach the rule of law with impunity so early in their administration, then it, you know, it's a source of worry. Mm -hmm. And it should be a source of worry to any well-meaning Zambian. Uh, when you look at uh, other, you know, instances of lawlessness, you, you've seen um, the extent to which UPND cadres attack uh, people that are perceived to have belonged to the patriotic front. And um, uh, uh, they torture them. We've seen so many videos to that effect. And uh, what has been missing in all this is a strong voice of condemnation from the president, Hakai Nde Ichirema. Do you think he did that? He had a presser. He had two, he, two press conferences. He, 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 he so where he talked about uh, you know, the, the, that violence and, and uh, asked people to stop it. He did not specifically talk about specific incidents of violence. He was talking about violence in general. You know, when you generalize a matter, it doesn't carry weight. Uh, if there is an incident where, uh, for instance, those UPND cadres who went to that Nathan Chanda police, um, police station mm. and they uh, started, uh, uh, you know, uh, vandalizing it, removing the, you know, the, the, the names of Nathan Chanda, uh, and yet that police post, uh, to the best of my recollection, was built through donations that uh, Nathan Chanda, as mayor of Rwanda, actually mobilized. So it was his own petty project, you understand? Just like a lot of other uh, uh, officials in the PF had their own petty projects. I remember uh, she built a school in, in Chimwemwe. So if, uh, not Chimwemwe, uh, some compound in Kitwe. So if he names that uh, petty project of his as, uh, you know, whatever name it is, why should someone go there and remove that name? If anybody doesn't like that police post, uh, the way it is named, they should build theirs, uh, their own. You know, they should mobilize their own resources. Don't you, so think, the police, don't you think the lessons. police should have stopped those, uh, you know, UPND and, and uh, cadres or supporters or members they should. Fr from, from vandalizing their police station? Because they, yes. they were there, the onus is on them, and, yes. and the president has made it very clear. No, no, no. Uh, they, they need to be free to operate and make sure that there's no lawlessness. You so know, don't you think you should be calling out the police on that incident? No, no, no. You know, at the end of the day, uh, President Hichirama's, um, you know, condemnation of violence, of lawlessness, is uh, not really backed up by action. You understand? It's not backed up by action. And uh, people can read between the lines. Because even uh, the former president, Rungo, used to condemn uh, violence. But we saw PF cadres misbehaving all over the press. But when he goes to address the media, he would condemn it. That's the same approach that uh, Haka Inde Ichirema has adopted as president. There's no difference in his approach. Um, the police know that without real backing of the president, they cannot do anything. We all remember how, you know, Kadarism ended during Manawasa's time. Uh, why did it end? Because Manawasa was assertive. He made pronouncements, but he followed up those pronouncements with actual action on the ground. If any Kadar misbehaved on the ground, um, uh, they would be quickly arrested and arraigned in court. Uh, how many UPND Kadars have so far been arrested for their lawlessness? So you can see that even the police know deep down their hearts to say, even if President Ichirema condemns uh, violence, whether it's political or any form of violence or misbehavior by his Kadars, he doesn't mean that. Uh, he's just, you know, he's just uh, talking for the sake of talking. 
uh, he's not walking his words. So that is where the problem is. So on the um, issue of uh, adherence to the rule of law, I think there is zero out of ten, as far as I'm concerned, uh, with regard to the UPND, both in terms of adherence to the constitution as well as uh, you know lawlessness of their party cadres. Where do you uh, think they have scored? So far, yes, in the two months that they have been in power. <laughs> It would be very difficult to identify any area, uh, uh, Peter, where I can say the UPND have done well in this particular area. Because uh, even straightforward areas like um, you know, agriculture, whereby the only thing they needed to do is to buy maize from farmers and store it somewhere. They are a government. They can figure out where to store the maize. They did not want to do that. They said, no, we are not buying maize anymore. First of all, instead of being honest to farmers, they first came up with an excuse that, no, uh, we don't have grain bags. Then why don't you buy the maize using the bags which the farmers have packaged the maize? No, those bags cannot be used for storage. Why not buy the maize in the current bags and then when you source those grain bags you're talking about, you transfer the maize to your so-called uh, long-term storage grain bags. Uh, they came up with all sorts of excuses while farmers were lining up at various depots waiting to have their maize bought. They failed to do that. That is a very basic task. And you know, at the end of the day, Peter, when you look at our society and you look at uh, the poor and vulnerable in our society, you realize that most of them are in the rural areas. Most of them are farmers, peasant farmers. And uh, when they grow a crop like maize, that is uh, mostly their only source of income. Uh, they wait the whole year just to be able to sell that maize so that uh, the person can go and uh, meet his basic financial obligations. They buy salt in the house. They buy uniforms for kids. So if you frustrate peasant farmers, you mm. fail to buy maize for them, then you, you are really being unfair to the poor and vulnerable well, in Mr. our Tembo, society. Mr. Tembo, government is not necessarily failing to buy maize. Uh, we do know that uh, this time around, FRA, uh, obviously it being an election, you know, we're getting into elections, so they decided to buy more maize than they usually buy. They hit the 500,000 metric tons that they, 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 they were supposed to buy, that they buy yearly. And they decided to increase it by a further 300,000. And, and uh, this is where uh, the whole drama has come from. But the additional, additional uh, grain that was going to be bought. And obviously, we were in an election year. You would actually cite that as a motivation for the extra, you know, uh, tonnage that FRA was supposed to take on. Peter, you can give all those explanations. But the bottom line is that the government has been promising to buy the maize. And that is the reason why those farmers are still waiting in those depots to have their maize bought. If government was honest to the farmers and told the farmers that we are not able to buy the maize from you because we've reached the target we wanted to buy, those farmers would not be in those depots waiting for months to have their maize bought. You understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, unless they are, they are confused. You can't be waiting uh, when someone has told you they are not coming. But uh, those farmers have been waiting for months in those depots across the country because government told them that uh, they'll buy the maize. And that is where the excuse of saying we are waiting for bags to give you bags, those uh, long-term storage uh, grain bags, so that you repackage your maize, that's when we'll buy it. That's why farmers are waiting. So government has been dishonest to the farmers, and after being dishonest to the farmers, they then proceeded to now tell the farmers that we won't buy your maize. Why didn't you tell the farmers three months ago or two months ago to say you won't buy the maize because you've met your, 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 your target? So uh, government has not been you know, sincere. It has been very it, dishonest. It's because those decisions and were made uh, by, by different, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a government led by a different political party. You know, at the end of the day, there are certain obligations. The government is the same. We only have one government. Yes. The government of the Republic of Zambia. Yes. Even if an led, administration... Even led if, by different people that if, are elected. Even if an administration changes, uh, it doesn't vary your obligations as a government. You understand? That is why even the Congole that we Congole mm -hmm. is still there, despite the change of government. So your obligations don't change, uh, Peter. It doesn't mean that when you have a new administration, then your obligations change. The obligations are to the government of Zambia, the government of the Republic of Zambia. And those are basic obligations. For someone like uh, Hakainde Ichirema, who ascended to the presidency on a ticket of uh, trying to uplift the poor in society, it is very, very you know, embarrassing for him to fail to buy maize from farmers. Uh, if I was elected president on the 12th of August, I will buy that maize. If I have to find storage, my government will find storage where to keep that maize. If I have to repackage it into long-term grain bags, my government will be responsible for that. But I'll get that obligation away from the peasant farmers so that they can have their time spared so that they can go back to their villages 
and start preparing their fields for the next farming season. You can't hold those peasant farmers at ransom. They are there for months at depots. You give them one excuse after the other. One minute you are telling them there are no grain bags. The other minute you are telling them, no, uh, we've reached our target. You can't treat uh, you know, poor and vulnerable citizens like that. That is totally unacceptable. Mr. Tembo, I, I want us to look at another issue that uh, you know, President Hakan H. Lema um, he, he launched a fierce fight uh, against corruption and abuse of state resources. And so far, results are being seen as evidenced in the Faith Musonda case. But uh, what will be your comment on the fight against corruption? Well, I'm hopeful that uh, uh, President Ichilema means every word of what he says when he says he's going to fight corruption. Um, like any law enforcement activity, the fight against com uh, corruption should be done fairly and equitably. Uh, what I mean by fairly and equitably is that it should not be used as a tool to persecute political opponents. Uh, we've seen that being used in the past, whereby specific political opponents are targeted in the name of fighting corruption. We don't want to see that. On the other hand, we do you know, accept and uh, agree that there was a lot of corruption under the PF administration and that there is need to identify those who are involved and to bring them to book. But that should be done in a sane manner. That should be done in a fair and objective manner. Uh, it should not be used as a tool for persecuting political opponents. Uh, I also want to look at the, you know, another issue in terms of uh, you know, appointments that have, uh, uh, that have been made. There seemingly to be a sort of uh, vacuum being created as head of state is taking too long to replace you know, the dismissed workers in some institutions. What would you say... Uh, you know, is the implication of that? So, you know, first of all, I must mention that for us, we've spoken about this issue over and over again. Um, you know, you cannot uh, go to a parastato and dissolve the board, and then you take months without appointing a new board. Mm -hmm. You can't go to a ministry and fire the PS, and then you don't appoint another PS. Because uh, decisions need to be made. And uh, as an economist himself, uh, you know, you expect the HH to uh, understand these basic things. Uh, you understand the wheels of commerce and trade cannot be brought to a standstill simply because you are deciding who to appoint to a specific um, uh, board. Uh, if uh, President Ichirema was not ready to replace the boards he has dissolved, he should not have dissolved them in the first place. He should have allowed them to continue operating. Um, uh, at the end of the day, you find that uh, our economy, in fact, most economies in the world, the biggest player in any economy, uh, in most economies in the world, is the government and its various agencies and parastatals. So when you have, for instance, Zesco without a board, or you have uh, ZPPA without a board, or RATSA without a board, the total effect of that is that uh, decisions which were supposed to be made, uh, certain contracts for employees which were supposed to be considered for renewal, uh, certain contracts uh, uh, to suppliers which were uh, in the evaluation stage and were supposed to be awarded. All those things are now at a standstill. So even people who were awarded a contract and waiting for contract signing, all, this, all those things are now at a standstill um, uh, simply because there's a vacuum in terms of an organization not having a board. And even from a corporate governance point of view, um, I mean, a, a managing director or CEO is uh, supposed to take directives from the board. Mm -hmm. So in the absence of a board, who is uh, that person getting directives from? Uh, yeah. That is why decisions cannot be made. And when things are at a standstill, it has a trickle-down effect because the person who won a contract at Zesco and was supposed to start implementation two months ago will not be able to do that. Mm -hmm. It means that the employees that he hired uh, on the basis and strength that he has won a contract would have to be laid off. It means that those people who were excited that, oh, I've got a job because my company has won a tender at Zesco, uh, will go back to their wives and children and say, uh, you know what, that job hasn't started yet because the contract hasn't been signed. And why is the contract not signed? Because uh, President Ichirem has not yet uh, appointed a replacement board to Zesco. So it has that trickle-down effect to the common Zambian on the ground. Uh, it has uh, an adverse effect on, the, you know, on economic growth and already we are battling with the effects, the economic effects of COVID-19. You would not expect a president who is supposed to be an economist to start adding, you know, to the slowdown in economic activity. It's not supposed to be like that. So we are very disappointed. And to us, you know, from the time that HH was in opposition, 
I personally held a very low opinion of his capability to run the affairs of this country. Um, and, and, you know, that opinion was um, uh, based on what I had observed, uh, the way he was doing things when we were in the alliance, the opposition alliance. He did not strike me as someone who could get things done. Even basic, basic activities that we were doing as a collective of opposition political parties during that time, um, it was, um, I don't know how to describe it, but he was, he was a, a lame guy. And uh, up to now, I think he has, uh, uh, he's proving himself day by day to the Zambian people that he's a lame president. Uh, to a large extent, Peter, if you allow me, I think uh, uh, HH's biggest handicap is that uh, he tries too hard to be a shadow of uh, late former President Manawasa. Um, HH believes very strongly that... In what way? Uh, uh, HH believes very strongly that uh, um, uh, Manawasa was a perfect president. You know, Manawasa made a, a couple of achievements, but uh, in my view, he's very far from being described as a perfect president. That is why if you study the activities of HH after he became president, he tries to associate himself with those ministers that served under Manawasa, hoping that whatever good performance uh, was recorded under Manawasa by associating with the Manawasa's uh, former people, uh, that uh, performance will be replicated in HH's new administration. He tries to appoint Manawasa's relatives. He tries to do everything that Manawasa did. But Manawasa was Manawasa. HH, if he wants to be able to perform as president of this country, he needs to be his own man. He doesn't need to be a shadow of Manawasa, no. And he tries very hard to be uh, Manawasa's shadow. That's why he even went and um, uh, picked an old retired man uh, as finance minister, as uh, simply because he was one of uh, Manawasa's um, economic advisors. So the day that HH becomes his own man, the day that he, um, he's able to um, make decisions not on the basis of trying to replicate what Manawasa did about uh, 15 years ago, but based on what the current situation is, that is the day that we are going to have a real president for this country. Otherwise, at the moment, we only have a shadow of a president. Mr. Tembo, you, you brought up, uh, you know, your, the name of the finance minister and is going to be on the spotlight this Friday uh, because uh, it's going to be very important for the, for the UPND Alliance administration as finance minister Stumbeko Musokotwane will be presenting the 2022 national budget. Having been, you know, uh, presenting alternative budgets for a couple of years yourself, uh, what lessons, if any, have you learned from developing and presenting alternative budgets? Well... Um, f for us, uh, we first uh, developed and presented an alternative budget in the year 2016, just uh, when we were formed as Patriots for Economic Progress. And uh, like you rightly put it, Peter, we have consistently and continuously developed and presented alternative budgets. And um, uh, some of the key lessons that we learned through this development and presentation of alternative budgets is that... Um, uh, it is uh, usually very difficult to strike a balance uh, in terms of uh, allocating, you know, resources. Mm -hmm. But even before you talk about allocating resources, in terms of mobilizing resources to strike a perfect balance, um, when you look at your sources of income as a government, uh, they are twofold. Uh, there's internally generated resources through tax and non-tax revenue, and then you've got uh, the borrowing. Um, uh, and so you need to strike a balance between those two. Uh, even the tax itself, um, of course, you can't overtax the economy. Um, uh, so you need to work on tax efficiency, trying to collect the most that you can using existing tax rates without having to increase tax rates. So those are some of the lessons that we picked. And also, you know, for us, when we first um, uh, developed and presented our alternative budget, I think um, um, I would say... Uh, we did not have a full understanding of mm. how a national budget actually operates um, um, uh, in terms of uh, allocation of resources to various uh, needy areas. And with the passage of time, uh, the more we developed and presented these alternative budgets, the more we became experts at it. And, um, you know, one of the key things that I've always advocated for and uh, which uh, I'm hoping the new, you know, UPND administration will address is the... Um, issue the question of how best to assist the poor and vulnerable in our society. How best can we assist those people? Mm -hmm. um, there, there are basically two approaches. There is, uh, on one hand, you've got, um, uh, you know, social welfare, uh, examples being, you know, social cash transfer. 
Uh, on the other hand, you've got economic empowerment, uh, where you can give these people small loans uh, so that they can start small businesses and be able to empower themselves. For me, Peter, I've been a very, very, you know, uh, strong um, uh, proponent um, uh, or proposer of economic empowerment. Um, I do not believe that uh, people need to be given handouts in the name of social cash transfer unless those people are very old, such that they cannot economically, you know, contribute to the to the nation. Maybe people above 75 years, those can be given handouts. Or people who are physically disabled. But even those people who are physically disabled, uh, the first, uh, you know, uh, attempt by government should be to try and find a way they can empower them by making them productive in, you know, whatever small way. Mm. I always give the example to say, when you look at these targets uh, that have been put around the country, those tall booths, the people who sit there collecting money, there's no need of having an able-bodied person there because that person sits the whole day. They don't go anywhere. They're just in the tall booth there. So why not put people who are physically challenged in there? Because people who are physically challenged cannot go and work at a construction site as a laborer. You understand? Put them there, give them those jobs, list, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep those jobs just for people who are physically challenged. Then those people who are able-bodied, if they don't have any other job, they can go to a construction site and uh, carry some wood, you know, they can be darker boys there because they are physically able. So give a privilege to those. Even during unique days, uh, Trevor, uh, during KK's time, you know, jobs like uh, telephone operator were restricted to what type of people, uh, if you remember? I'll ask you this question. It was for people who are visually impaired, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. I hope that is the politically correct uh, term to use, visually impaired. Um, why? Because those people who are visually impaired cannot go and do certain other jobs. So they can do that job. So you give it to them. You restrict uh, that kind of job to people like that only. So we can assist people who are incapacitated, people who are, um, you know, uh, uh, handicapped. Uh, uh, and the charity should only be given to those people who are handicapped who cannot get any other job. You understand? Because charity, when you talk about charity, when you talk about handouts, someone has to work hard first, generate money, then you tax that person who has worked hard, and you come and give this person who uh, is, uh, you know, uh, poor, so to say, who is economically challenged. And the question, and if the person is able bodied, then the question, a moral question arises, uh, uh, Peter. Uh, is this person who is economically challenged, uh, is he economically challenged because he's lazy or he's economically challenged because he never had an opportunity mm. uh, to utilize? So, so, you know, it's very difficult to justify someone who is able-bodied but uh, uh, needs to be given a handout. Why can't they go out there and uh, approach any of the chiefs and ask for a piece of land and farm that land? and produce some maize and hope that government buys it from them. Or do something productive, you understand? So at the end of the day, there's that moral question because uh, someone is breaking their, you know, their back, they are waking up at 0, 04 in the morning, they are productive, they generate some money for themselves, and then government taxes them and then gets that tax and gives to this person who is able-bodied but uh, is not you know, productive for whatever reason. It could be that he is unfortunate. It could be that he, you know his parents never sent him to school. It could be that he is lazy too. You understand? So there is that moral challenge. You understand? So for me, I've never believed in charity. If someone wants to be assisted, Let, let's let's be specific when you say charity from government. Are you talking about the social cash transfer program? Yes, yes. When you look at the number of beneficiaries for the so social cash transfer but, program but, but in 2021, yes. you are talking about two million people. That's a huge number. It's a huge number of many, elderly. No, vulnerable people, no, no, no. Mr. Tembo. No, no, no. Uh, there's a breakdown, uh, Peter. Yes. There's a breakdown for that. Uh, uh, two million is not uh, uh, all elderly people. I can assure you that. I can assure you about that. You can... Uh, there's a criteria. You can call... You can call any, there's a criteria, yes. You, they use, obviously. But, uh, the, the elderly, the majority, the elderly uh, differently abled people... They are part uh, of that, but that the list. elderly are less than 10% of that. Less than, in fact, less than 5%. The majority are just... Uh, you know, uh, average uh, middle-aged people. You understand? People who are... You're not uh, speculating, Mr. Tembo. I'm not. You can call... You are speculating, you can, you Mr. Can Tembo. Call, you can call the Department of Social Welfare. Uh, uh, ask one of your producers to call the director there, and you put them on the line. They'll give you a breakdown. You cannot have two million uh, people above 75 years uh, of age in Zambia, uh, Peter. You can't have that. Even when you look at the breakdown of our population uh, in Zambia, you can't have two million people above 80 years old. 
That's uh, a huge number. You it's not that. 80 years old, uh, really. It's, or even it's, 75. It's, being, it's, it's being vulnerable and being elderly. When, when and, look, and if you look at if you look at our life expectancy here in Zambia, it's, it's about 40 years old. So if you're 60 years old or 65 years old in this country, which is retirement age, you're considered to be elderly. You don't have to be 80 years old, Mr. Tembo. So we don't have 2 million people who are elderly. Look at the demographics. If you want, you can just check on the internet. Uh, go to the statistics uh, uh, office website. You see a breakdown of our 18 million population. Uh, how many people are below the age? You find that most of them, in fact, uh, about 70% of our population is below the age of 30. And then you see the breakdown, those between 30 and 40. You find that the people above 75 uh, you know, less than maybe 3% of the total population. It's a very small number. So, so you'd, call, the you'd, bottom call, line, you'd call for an audit of uh, the social cash transfer? The bottom line, Trevor, is that if you are going to assist people, you need to assist them in a sustainable manner. Instead of giving them a handout, you need to be able to uh, empower them so that when you assist them today, tomorrow you don't go back to them to give them another handout. They need to be able to carry their own weight going forward. That is the, the philosophy that I've always advocated for, and that is the philosophy that I'm hoping. Yeah? I'm just but hoping this amounts, that this the new government is this going amount's to given out by you know in this social cash transfer. Uh, it's, it's not an amount that you can actually be motivated to receive every month because it's very very minimal. Yes, uh, the, but, uh, some get as low as seventy eight kwacha, exactly sixty five kwacha, exactly. exactly. And the most for the most vulnerable, it goes up to one hundred and seventeen kwacha and one hundred and seventy kwacha. Which understand? These are not these are not monies that which, would put people would you know uh, place people in a position which, to to just be waiting and depending on, which, on government to, to deposit for them. Which underscores my point, Peter, because um, it's not an effective way of helping people. That has been my point. If uh, instead of giving people 100 quarters, if you put that money together, let's say um, uh, you are supposed to benefit 100 people, that's 10,000 quarters, you get that 10,000 quarters and give it as a loan to one person to go and start a business. And then that person starts paying back. Uh, it, it, it would be more effective because... If that person is hardworking, they'll be able to sustain themselves. Maybe after a year, they would have paid back that 10,000 quarts as small loan. And then you can use that money to give a loan to the next person. And within a period of five to 10 years, you find that all those people that were uh, relying on 100 quarter handouts are now running their own sustainable businesses. You understand? So it's better to allocate resources towards economic empowerment than towards charity, towards handouts, towards social cash transfer. The only people, like I said, uh, uh, Peter, the only people that should be given uh, social cash transfer are those people who are truly vulnerable. The elderly and those who are physically you know, challenged and cannot be given any other job. Those are the only exceptions. Let's, let's go back to your alternative budget. Um, have you had any positive impact on formulation of uh, you know, the official national budget, if any? Uh, what are those? Yeah, we've had. Uh, we've had uh, in a number of ways. Um, most of the things that we have advocated for, uh, for instance, um, we advocated for the fact that uh, taxation needs to be fair and equitable. Uh, when you look at our um, tax framework at the moment, you find that uh, um, almost 40% of tax revenue is collected from employees, um, uh, whereas uh, uh, corporate tax you know, accounts for less than 15% of the total tax revenue. Uh, so, so there's a moral issue there because... Most of the people who are taxed are people who are, you know, they get very, a 4,000 kwacha, the food basket at the moment is 7,000 kwacha. So that 4,000 kwacha tax ex exemption is very small. Uh, so, so we need to revise our tax framework so that we make our tax fair and equitable. Uh, we, were, we have been advocating for this for a long time. And over the years, we've seen the payee uh, exempt portion being increased by government. Mm -hmm. And we believe that that has been because of our advocacy to try and reduce the tax on employees, on individuals, and uh, try to collect more tax from companies. You understand? Um, I'm hoping that uh, the budget that the minister presents this Friday will further increase the tax-exempt portion of pay-as-you-earn from the current uh, 4,000 kwacha, uh, hopefully to 5,000 kwacha. Um, that, that, that will reflect the increased cost of living, and uh, it will also... Uh, reflect a bit of fairness in terms of how we apply our taxation policy on the country. Because at the end of the day, uh, 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 Peter, 
uh, we all need to contribute to the tax pool. Mm -hmm. um, but that needs but to do you be think based. that's possible? Uh, that looking, at, to be. looking at the debt situation we're in right now, because obviously this new dawn administration needs to collect as much tax as it can to uh, have this debt cleared off, have the debt restructured, and have a way of actually having a plan to repay back this debt. But do you think... Uh, that's really, really, you know, possible for the threshold to be it increased is. by that much? It is. It is. Uh, so the focus should stop being on taxing individuals, like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. The focus should be on taxing corporates, um, big corporates. Because in my view, there's a lot of tax evasion when it comes to big corporates, specifically corporates in the mining sector. But uh, not only in the mining sector, even in other sectors as well. Um, in my view, you know, when you look at the entire economy, the only sector that is very heavily taxed and that is uh, uh, efficiently taxed is the financial services sector. Uh, you know, when you talk about banks and uh, you talk about these um, uh, uh, microfins, uh, they are number one heavily taxed because they are taxed at 40% uh, corporate tax. And then uh, they are efficiently taxed because there is very little tax evasion when you look at the financial sector. Uh, largely because of those, re uh, those returns that they have to submit to Bank of, uh, Bank of uh, you know, Zambia. Uh, so, so Bank of Zambia is able to monitor their revenue and the, the accumulation of their profits almost in real time. Mm -hmm. But when you look at other sectors, even the manufacturing sector, or you look at the mining sector, you realize that there's a lot of tax evasion there. So if government increased its uh, tax efficiency in terms of correcting the amounts that are due to the treasury from the mining sector, not increasing the tax rates, but just uh, increasing the efficiency of correcting whatever is due to government, then uh, they can uh, fill the hole that would be created by increasing the uh, payers UN threshold from the current 4,000 quarter to 5,000 quarter very easily. Very easily. So if I was running the affairs of government, that is how I would do, you know, structure my tax policy. You know, you give the people, the individuals, a reprieve and make sure the corporates are paying a fair, uh, you know, their fair share of tax. And um, most of these corporates, um, uh, uh, Peter, uh, for me, especially in the mining sector, I've always argued from time uh, immemorial that as a nation, we don't get the benefit we're supposed to get from the mining sector, uh, whether it is in terms of, uh, you know, uh, employment creation, you find that most of the high paying jobs are occupied by foreigners. Mm. Uh, and yet we've got uh, engineers, you know, metallurgists graduating from Copper Belt University, University of Zambia, all over the country every year. And these people uh, don't have jobs. They can't find those jobs, uh, professional jobs in the mining sector. They end up, uh, you know, selling hardware at town center. We can't have such a situation because those are our mines. They're supposed to create employment for Zambians because they are Zambian mines. Those people who come to invest should just come with their money, invest here, use our people to work for them so that uh, our people can earn an income. Otherwise, at the end of it all, when the copper is finished, we won't have anything to show for it. Mm. Another issue is in terms of suppliers. Most of these mines have even shifted their procurement centers from Zambia, some to Johannesburg, others to Toronto, Canada, others to uh, India. You understand? That is where their procurement center is. So if you are running a, a mine in, 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 in Mfurira or in Chingola, why should your procurement center be in Jobek? Yeah? Uh, you find that most of the bigger suppliers to the mines are people who, you know, companies which come from wherever that investor is coming from. Why should it be like that? When these mines were run by ZCCM, uh, Peter, uh, we had a vibrant manufacturing uh, industry in, in Dola. And those were indigenous Zambians, most of them. So those people who want to supply to the mines, if I was running the affairs of this country, I would, do, in fact, put um, a moratorium on the uh, importing of most of those uh, things they need for mining, you know, uh, and uh, tell those people who want to supply to the mines to come and set up uh, manufacturing shops here in Zambia so that we create employment. Okay. We need, you know, if we're going to change the economic uh, tide of our country, mm. as president, you need a president who is pragmatic, a president who is forceful, who can push these guys around. Because these guys, they are cartels all over the economy. Whichever sector you look at, they are cartels. You talk about milling mill, milling companies, they are cartels. You talk about cement, they are cartels. You talk about uh, day old chickens, uh, they are cartels. So they are cartels all over the economy. You understand? They go and have their meetings out there outside the country on how they are going to uh, maneuver around to exploit you, the common consumer. So if you are going to change the fortunes of the Zambian people as president, you need to have a backbone. You can't be too much of a gentleman, always afraid of offending the so-called investors. No, you need to be forceful. You need to sit them down and tell them, we know about this cartel behavior. 
And when uh, institutions uh, such as uh, the Competition and Consumer uh, Protection Commission, when they do their investigations, when they impose their fines, you should not have government intervention stopping those fines from being paid. These people need to pay fines. You, when you go to other countries like uh, Nigeria, they find the MTN in Nigeria more than $100 million. And they had to pay $100 million. So these fines that uh, we impose on these cartels here, these are small fines, $10 million, $5 million. And yet, whenever you have uh, such a fine, instead of government um, insisting on those institutions to pay, you find government uh, goes to the defense of those uh, cartel members. So at the end of the day, it is the Zambian, you and I, Peter, you mm. and I, who are exploited. Why? Because this country, for a very long time, has never had a president who has the backbone to challenge these corporates who form cartels so that they stop exploiting the Zambian people. Until such a time that Zambia has a president with a backbone, these cartels will continue exploiting the Zambian people, will continue buying chicken, that same chicken. Are you that, man with, are you that man with the backbone? Of course, of course. I've got the backbone. I can sit these people down in you know, a good way. The fact that you are firm and strong on them doesn't mm. mean that you harass them, no. But you, but said, you sit them down. But, but you just earlier said you don't have to be a gentleman. Yes, you need to tell them. But then again, you're, you're, you're contradicting yourself, Mr. Tembo. You know, being a gentleman, when you try to be too soft and too nice to everybody, you can't get anything done, Peter. You can't. So you need to be firm, but you need to be uh, uh, civil about it, and you need to have facts on your hands. If you have the facts on your hands, and uh, you are telling people to say, you, you guys who do these day old chicks, I know that you have a cartel. I know that's why you are restricting the production of these day old chicks. I know that's why the price of chicken has increased by more than 100% over the past nine months. So if you, stop, if you don't stop your, um, your cartel behavior, mm. these are the measures we are going to take. They will stop immediately if okay. you tell them in their faces. But if you have a president who tries too much to be a gentleman, he believes in capitalism too much, he believes that the market will regulate itself based on supply and demand, those are textbook theories. Real life doesn't work on those textbook theories. So uh, HH needs to stop being a theoretical economist. He needs to be a president with a backbone. He needs to stop the exploitation of the Zambian people, the Zambian consumer, from these cartels all over the economy, whichever sector of the economy you talk about. When okay. you look at the cement production, for instance, um, uh, Peter, if you allow me just a minute, you know, a lot of studies that have been done have uh, revealed that the average cost of producing a 50 kg bag of cement is about 55 quarts. But you know how much the cost of cement is in the shops? In it's between uh, 138 and, uh, and 140. Uh, yes. So, so why should these people be making those super normal profits? You understand? They, they are exploiting the Zambian people. They're exploiting the Zambian people. And the uh, CCPC, the Competition and um, Consumer Protection Commission, you know, they investigated this matter. They found a number of people guilty. One of the companies, Dangote, even testified against the other companies. You understand? And yet, up to now, no action is being taken. Why? Because there's government interference. Uh, they just call these ministers aside and say, ah, no, we'll donate um, uh, 50 million to your party. And uh, especially these UPND guys who have come now. But those, are, those are allegations, are, Mr. Tembo. You don't have evidence of that. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Uh, that's how the cartels manage to thrive, guys. You think they just thrive by lucky. By but that's, that's speculation, so, so Mr. Tembo. You, you, don't have, you don't have evidence to uh, that, so I'm, you can't say that. You, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. They'll call one of the ministers aside and say, we'll make a contribution to your party. And then they will know, the party knows that they've got a lot of uh, cadres and their youth who are hungry. They say, ah, if they donate 50 million to us, we can uh, try to empower our cadres and uh, stop them from making noise uh, and uh, protesting every day. So they'll bribe them. And uh, through that bribery, the cartel continues. Otherwise, cartels wouldn't continue. If you go to a country which has uh, lower levels of corruption, you go to countries like the U.S., uh, even South Africa. South Africa, the competition uh, commission there is very, very strict. They find those uh, corporates not playing around. They'll find them as much as 300 million rand. And they pay. You understand? Because they're firm, they're strict. You go to countries like that, you find that... Uh, uh, those people are able to do that because they don't put co uh, political considerations when uh, these institutions are doing their job. I but in Zambia, there's too yeah. much political consideration. There's too much trying to... And, uh, you know, the problem, Peter, starts from making too many promises. When you are a president like HH, who made too many promises to your people, and now you are a president, you can't be 
an effective president. You can't be a president with a backbone. Right, because Mr. Tembo, because I want us, before, before, because I'm looking at the time, I want us to, you know, uh, quickly touch on your expectations on uh, the budget that Dr. Stumbo Komsokotwano will present on Friday. Let's look at those expectations and we involve the people to actually be uh, part of this conversation. In case you're just listening to us, in case you're just joining us right now, we're with Pep President uh, Sean Tembo on the Hot Seat Radio program this morning. We're live on Kwitu FM on 93.3. Once again, I'm Tim Vela, Kwitu FM, uh, 93.3 Sakatina ba shon tembo pa uh, pa hot seat lelo. Tifuna mo tumi ma phone. In the next ten minutes, we'll open up the phone lines on zero nine seven four eight seven zero eight seven seven zero nine five zero nine five five eight seven seven. And to those watching us live on Facebook on the Hot FM Facebook page on the Quito FM Facebook page, uh, please send us those advanced questions. We'd like to hear uh, from you. We'll put them forward to Mr. Tembo here. He will get to uh, you know uh, respond to your questions. Mr. Tembo, Dr. Msokotwane is uh, presenting the budget this Friday. What are your expectations of this new dawn uh, national budget? Yeah, so our expectations, first of all, um, I think uh, beginning with, the, because when you look at a budget, it's twofold. Mm -hmm. There is the revenue part of it. You need to raise the money. Mm -hmm. And then the expenditure part of it, how you're going to spend the money. So mm -hmm. that's a, a budget basically. So on the revenue part of it, in terms of uh, resource mobilization, of course, you've got uh, the debt and um, you have the uh, you know, domestically raised uh, uh, resources, uh, which are made up of uh, tax revenue and non-tax revenue. Our expectation is that uh, the new administration needs to ensure that uh, the budget is funded at least 90% by domestic resources. 90% by domestic resources. And when I say domestic resources, I don't mean domestic debt. Uh, I mean tax mm. and non-tax revenue. And uh, that uh, can easily be achieved because um, all we need to do is increase our tax efficiency. Our tax efficiency has been very low, uh, Peter. Uh, it's the lowest in the region, actually. Uh, uh, it is uh, generally measured by the tax revenue to GDP ratio, which uh, has been standing at about an average of about 17% for the past uh, eight years or so. But in 2021, our tax revenue to GDP ratio actually dropped to 14% when you look at the 2021 national budget. So if we are at 14%, the average in the region is 25%. Uh, it simply means that we are not able to milk the cow. So if you are not able to milk the cow properly, then what you need is not a bigger cow. What you need is a way of properly milking the cow that you have. Mm -hmm. You understand? So we can't be talking about economic growth when we fail to get the benefits of the current uh, economy that we have in terms of being able to efficiently collect tax. And um, um, so, so we are hoping that they will address that. But also on the issue of non-tax revenue. For us, we have always believed that uh, there has been a lot of pilferage when it comes to non-tax revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, you're talking about money such as targets. You're talking about money such as fines and what, what, you know. Um, there's a lot of pilferage in that. I'll give you an example of targets. When we had one target, um, uh, government collected about 2.5 uh, uh, billion kwacha, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, in a year. And then we had three targets, and then they collected 1.8 billion kwacha. Uh, so there, there's no correlation there. So there's a lot of pilferage. And uh, if the UPND in their budget do not uh, uh, increase the amount of money we are collecting from non-tax revenue, it simply means that uh, the UPND ministers are the ones eating that money that U uh, uh, PF ministers used to eat. You understand? It means that they've continued uh, the pilferage, only that uh, they've removed it from those aligned to PF and they've given it to those aligned to UPND. Otherwise, we're supposed to see an increment in the amount of non-tax revenue collected if the pilferage is stopped or even if it's not stopped 100 percent if it is reduced maybe uh, reduced by 60 to 70 percent we are supposed to see a huge increase in the amount of non-tax revenue so that's what we'll be looking at in the budget but uh, also on the issue of um, um, borrowing uh, whether it is external debt domestic mm. debt or infrastructure debt or domestic areas we expect the government, the UPND government, through the budget to liquidate, to have a timeline, to announce a timeline through which they will liquidate the domestic areas. You know, currently, Trevor, our domestic areas stand at almost 30 billion kwacha. And uh, domestic areas are basically monies which government owes to various suppliers of goods and services. People who supplied uh, mini meal to boarding schools, people who supplied medicines to hospitals. When you add all that, uh, uh, all, all, all that money which government owes, that amounts to domestic areas. 
And you cannot have an economy the size of Zambia, as small as Zambia, where government, which is the biggest economic player, owes various supplies of goods and services uh, above uh, 30 billion kwacha. What that means is that uh, the economy is almost at a standstill because people who supplied things to government cannot function. And most of these entities, uh, Peter, are small entities. Mm -hmm. So you find that uh, they'll win one tender, maybe worth uh, 3 million kwacha. They'll even mortgage their house, um, uh, maybe even mortgage the brother's house, uh, even sell off a car, maybe, just to supply that particular tender mm -hmm. so that they can make a profit. And then they supply that tender, and then government fails to pay them. It means that uh, the house they had mortgaged will be taken over by the bank, um, uh, and, and uh, the employees they had will have to be laid off. So it's chaotic. So one of the steps that the UPND government should take, uh, which should be reflected in Friday's budget, is a specific allocation to liquidate, to liquidate the domestic areas in a period of not more than uh, 24 months. They need to totally liquidate domestic areas. And then the other key issue is um, that we expect the minister to do in the budget uh, on Friday is to reduce significantly, at least by 50 to 60 percent, the amount of domestic debt. You know, our domestic debt now stands at about uh, 130 billion kwacha. When you talk about domestic debt, uh, Peter, you're talking about the government bonds, you're talking about the treasury bills, and other borrowings that government does uh, using the Bank of Zambia as an agent. So when the Bank of Zambia issues those bonds or treasury bills, they are doing it on behalf of government. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble with that, uh, in terms of the impact on the economy, of having huge domestic debt is that, uh, you know, as, as, as a government, you are wiping out all the liquidity from the market. You are getting all the money from the market, which these financial institutions like banks, we are supposed to lend to entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs need access to affordable funding. That is why our interest rates, our lending rates are very high in Zambia. You're talking about average lending rates of uh, 30%, 32%. Mm -hmm. When you go even down here in Namibia, average lending rates are 7%. You go to Botswana, it's about 7.5. You go to South Africa, it's about 8%. You go even to Zim, the lending rates are very low. Here in Zambia, they are very high. That is why we don't have... Uh, we have very few successful local entrepreneurs. Most of the people die with their ideas. They go to the grave. You go to Memorial Park there. You look at the tombstone. You know that this man had a big dream of what to do, but he died with his dreams he was not able to implement. Why? Because he was not able to access affordable financing. People out there, they produce entrepreneurs, big entrepreneurs every day, because when you have an idea, you dream about something at night. In the morning, you go to the bank, you submit a business proposal, and the bank finances your idea. And uh, you, know, you succeed. You become a big businessman. But in Zambia, it's literally impossible. So government needs to reduce on domestic uh, borrowing. When government stops borrowing too much from these financial uh, companies, the banks and microfins, what will happen is that these banks will have a lot of money lying idle because government has stopped borrowing from them. And then what are they going to be doing? They'll be fo following people up. You receive a phone call, Peter, and uh, it will be your bank saying, uh, Mr. Peter, uh, would you like to get a loan from us? Uh, we can give you a loan of up to $2 million. And then your ideas will begin to form and say, ah, $2 million, I, I can start it, something. Then you go and visit your bank. But for as long as the banks are able to lend to government and they're able to um, make very, very attractive, um, you know, make very attractive interest uh, and it's risk-free, they will never rent to you because when they rent to you or me, they always think about you defaulting. You mm -hmm. understand? And why should they rent to someone who has a high chance of defaulting when they can rent to the government which has zero chance of defaulting and still collect handsome interest? So the moment government withdraws from the financial um, uh, uh, market, then the economy will stabilize. People will be able to access funding at reasonable rates. If I was running the affairs of this country, if I was president, if the Zambian people had given me the vote on the 12th of August, Peter, that is one of the first things I would implement. I would ensure that is done. And that is the most effective way of growing the economy, affordable financing. And once you do that, Peter, within a period of uh, three, four years, our interest rates can become comparable to the region. You can have single-digit uh, single, uh, 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 lending rates. Uh, you find that you go to a bank, you are able to borrow at 8%, 7%. Mm. And at that rate, anyone would be able to take the risk and mortgage their house. Right now, it's almost suicide to go and borrow from a bank because of the high interest rates.
Sean Tembo there, Pep President, on the Hot Seat Radio program this morning. Uh, we'd like to invite you to be part of the program this morning. Uh, you can give us a call on 974-870-877-0950-0955-877. The rules remain the same. Please introduce yourself, restrict yourself to one question. We'd like to accommodate as many people as we can on the show, as always. My name is Tim Vela, Pakwitu FM. We've got two minutes on my phone now. We're past 0974-870-877 or 0967-877-447. Kwitu FM 93.3 in Lusaka. We are live on that platform as well. To everybody watching us live on Facebook, send us those questions. We want to put them forward to the pep president, Mr. Sean Tembo. We'll read them live on air. And to everybody listening to us on 87.7 and on GSTV channel 912, you can get involved and ask your questions. It's 0974-870-877, 0950-955-877. Those are the lines you are reaching us on this morning. Hello, good morning. Hello, is it for the world? Yes, it is. Good morning to you. What's your name? Uh, my name is Michael. Michael, please go ahead. We have uh, Pep President Sean Tembo in studio. What questions do you have for him? Okay. Uh, I get what Mr. Tembo is uh, saying. Yeah, but now my question to him is uh, you have given your alternative uh, budget, but uh, are you aware that uh, in implementing such pieces, it's very difficult if the economy, the way things are running. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your question or contribution. Is it, Michael? It's 0974-870-877, Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Morning to you. What's your name? Uh, this is Caesar calling. Sivo? Caesar. Caesar. <laughs> Yes. All right, Caesar. Please go ahead. We have uh, Pep President Sean Tembo in studio. Okay. So, um, what I would like to find out from Mr. Tembo is he's talking about growing the economy and reducing government borrowing so that we can reduce uh, domestic uh, um, debt. The question is: Is he aware that most of these entrepreneurs, especially those that are bringing the FDI, they are not banking locally? So, how is he going to address that? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Michael. Thank you for uh, Caesar. Thank you very much for your call. It's zero nine seven four seven zero eight seven seven zero nine five zero nine five five eight seven seven. We'd like to hear from you this morning. Uh, those lines will get you through to the Hot Seat Radio program. We have Pep President Sean Tembo in studio. Uh, if you have a question for him, this is your opportunity to actually put it forward live on air. Good morning. Good morning, my brother. How are you? Good morning to you. What's your name? Um, Mr. Banda. Mr. Banda, please go ahead with your question. I want to ask Mr. John Tembo. Mr. John Tembo, you have seen how the routers are looting the man of Zambia by putting them in the houses. And again, the people who are trying to investigate are trying to steal the money. What's your comment about this investigation? That they are also hungry for the same money. Are they going for the money which they are trying to investigate or they are trying to investigate, investigate on what is the reality. Mm. That's my question. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, contribution. Uh, Mr. Tembo, I'll allow you to tackle those three. Uh, Michael, we had Michael, we had Caesar, we had uh, Mr. Banda as the last uh, uh, mm. caller for now. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think Michael was asking to say, um, don't we think it's difficult to implement our alternative budgets, especially in the current economic mm -hmm. environment? Um, you know, the purpose of uh, an opposition political party producing and uh, presenting alternative national budgets is uh, basically twofold. Number one, you want to give you know, formal advice to the government of the day to say, look, you are approaching these issues in this manner. We feel you need to approach them in this manner, in this particular manner. Whether it's the mining sector, whether it's agriculture, you know, uh, whatever it is. And uh, that advice is documented. So it's up to the government. Like any advice, Peter, people will come to you and advise you on different things, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It remains on you to decide which advice to adopt and which one not to. So the same, you know, the government has uh, uh, a choice to make whether to adopt uh, the advice we give them through our alternative budgets or not. Uh, the other purpose of uh, doing these alternative budgets is to demonstrate to the Zambian people and the electorate in, uh, you know, at large 
that we have the capability, we, we, we are able to fully understand the way a government functions, and we are able to propose alternative ways of doing things. And that if we are elected into office, if in 2026 the Zambian people make Sean Tembo their president, he is not going to start from scratch. He is not going to take uh, uh, a month without appointing cabinet. He is not going to take three months without appointing PSs. He is going to hit the ground running. Why? Because he has demonstrated that he understands what needs to be done and he is eager to start working. You understand? So that is another purpose. Um, an alternative budget is not really for the purpose of implementing because the government has got its own official budget, which it implements. So that is uh, with regard to the question by uh, Mr. Michael. Yeah. And uh, Caesar? With regard to Caesar, Caesar mm. raised a very pertinent um, uh, issue. Uh, the fact that um, most entrepreneurs these days are now banking outside the country. Um, you know why people are doing that? Because when you're banking outside the country, and you are showing you know, revenue in your bank account, whether it's in South Africa, whether it's in Namibia or Botswana or any other place, uh, when the time comes, when the need arises, you'll be able to approach your bank outside the country there and ask for a loan. And you know what? They'll give you a loan at a lower interest rate. Uh, a rate which is prevailing in that particular country. If you're talking about uh, Namibia, it's about 7%. So, so you are able to now raise that money at a lower interest rate and you can come and invest it here mm -hmm. as opposed to banking locally and then after banking for years with a particular bank, the day you want a loan, they tell you that uh, Mr. Tembo, we can give you the loan at a discounted interest rate of 34%. <laughs> How can 34% be discounted? It's not. It's too high. Unless you are engaging in some illegality, maybe you are selling drugs or you are running uh, something illegal, that's when you can repay at such an interest rate. Otherwise, a normal business, very few businesses make uh, that kind of uh, percentage profit per year. You understand? So that is why people are banking outside the country. And it comes down to the same issue I raised to say government needs to withdraw in terms of the extent to which it borrows from the domestic market through treasury bills and government bonds, because they are crowding out the private sector and also increasing the rate of interest. So that is with regard to Mr. Caesar. Coming to Mr. Banda, indeed, uh, Mr. Banda also raised a very varied uh, observation, which I find um, uh, 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 to be very embarrassing to the new Dawn government um, with regard to the new issue, the, the issue that happened uh, recently, whereby people who were sent to investigate someone who was said to have had uh, about $800,000 in their house, uh, ended up stealing the money or allegedly stealing the money. And now you've got uh, two people who are on the land, one of them a senior lawyer, another mm. one a police officer. Yeah, That is very regrettable because um, it should be able to make um, HH to reflect on his uh, fight against corruption. He needs to change tact and make sure that uh, he adopts a more credible approach. Because if you are sending people who are hungry for money like that to go and investigate uh, regarding money issues, then what are the chances that you, you'll be able to take cases to court and you'll be able to achieve a conviction? Because for, for you to achieve a conviction, um, you need the officers to do a proper investigation, you know, a solid investigation, something that can stand in court, and you need people to properly uh, uh, be able to testify in court for you to be able to secure a conviction. But if the people you are sending to do these investigations are people you know, that are too hungry for money, then you need to address that issue before you proceed with the, whatever investigations you are doing in terms of this money laundering uh, and the theft that took place uh, during the PF government. He needs to change his tact. He needs to reflect. Yeah, so that is uh, uh, my view on that. Uh, All right, I'll, I'll quickly read one question as well from uh, from our Facebook uh, feed. Uh, Kabungo Tente says, uh, Mr. Tembo, don't you think besides increasing the threshold to 5,000 kwacha, which is uh, the threshold for uh, uh, tax exemptions, uh, uh, to 5,000 kwacha, the pay should be lowered to a certain percentage? Of course. Of course. Um, when you look at our alternative budget, um, uh, Peter, we have been very consistent on that, um, on giving relief to individuals, because individuals are not mm -hmm. able to save. That is the other down, downside of having high uh, tax on individuals. They are not able to save. Mm. Uh, you find that people get paid um, on the 25th. By the first of the month, the money is finished. The people don't have uh, savings accounts. It's hand-to-mouth. And uh, the trouble with that is that by the time someone retires, 
uh, especially with this new you know way of hiring people where people are given gratuity gratuity when someone retires you find that they become destitute you mm -hmm. understand uh, they don't have any saving on which they can live on or even start a business so when you reduce the taxation in our alternative budgets we've always advocated for a flat rate of 25 percent you understand a flat rate of 25 percent and uh, the same is applicable uh, with regard to corporate tax uh, so so the thing is you know when you look at our tax framework uh, here in zambia peter if you allow me quickly you realize that it's upside down you know why i say that because we have very high tax rates very high tax rates our tax rates are the highest in the region whether you look at pay as you earn the upper band of the 7.5 percent or you look at um, corporate tax which is um, uh, uh, 30 percent 35 percent and uh, for banks it's even 40 percent you go to the region you find that in south africa corporate tax rate is 25 percent you go to botswana the corporate tax rate is 25 percent um, uh, and yet we are not collecting as much tax revenue proportionally compared to the other countries in the region mm -hmm. our tax revenue to gdp ratio is the lowest in the region despite having the highest tax rates that tells you that there's something wrong there you understand so what we should be doing is to reduce the tax rates and increase on tax efficiency on compliance because when you have very high tax rates it creates a ripe environment for corruption to take place for tax evasion to take place um, uh, if someone is importing something uh, a vehicle which they bought for two thousand dollars and they are made to pay uh, uh, another two thousand dollars at the border it's like paying double mm -hmm. what you what you bought for uh, it's ridiculous. Someone would rather find means and ways of trying to sneak that vehicle into the country. And they would rather, out of that $2,000, they would rather bribe a ZRI officer, maybe $300, bribe a LATSA officer when registering, another $300, $600. They save $1,400. So the affinity, the appetite for tax evasion, the appetite for corruption becomes very high. Why? Because the government has created a conducive environment a conducive atmosphere for corruption for tax evasion to actually take place so that is where the problem is whereas when you re you reduce these tax rates and make them reasonable someone will be debating and say ah, why should i run away from uh paying a, a you know a tax at the border of which is reasonable mm. and uh, then i risk going to jail why should i do that uh, let me just pay why because the rate is reasonable so it is in the interest of a nation, it is in the interest of government, it is in the interest of all Zambians that our tax rates, all our tax rates be revised, and they should be revised downwards, and then enforcement should be increased so that tax evasion can be brought down. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, allowed ZRA to perform very well during King's Rich and Daz's uh, tenure was that he was able to clamp down on most of the smuggling that was taking place at the border. Why? Because he understood how most of that smuggling was being done because he had been in the private sector before he ran a clearing firm you know clearing and forwarding firm so he understood the loopholes which are there and he was able to seal those loopholes of course loopholes the way they operate you seal one today tomorrow there's a new one which opens but he was able to do that and our hope and wish is that the new uh, commissioner general zra is going to continue on that because that is where most of the leakage of our you know tax revenue is at the borders and also with regard to the mines so if someone is able to do that then we're home and dry so we need to revise our tax rates down make them reasonable uh, create a bigger appetite for people to comply and pay tax all right it's your 974-870-877 good morning hello hello good morning morning sir how are you good how are you doing what's your name my morning your name again Maimbo Livingi. Maimbo. Eh. Maimbo, please go ahead with your contribution. We have Mr. Tembo in studio. Okay, but Tembo mo ka bwanje. Ta o ka kuru mo ka bwanje mo. Ta o ka bwino. Eh, but Tembo, ni ona monga kamba kwanu kutandiza mazamja. Ndava uta ataki manini kuri ba president, nise ju mbatandize. Wame wafu ni konsita, but mba chita ataki manini. Nise wangati kapele kapitali, nise kamene munaru za manini, nise nini ziyo. Mind boy, is that all? 
Okay. Uh, I think you'll get to respond to that later. Uh, 0974 870 877 Good morning. Good morning. Morning. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Good morning, Mr. Tembo, President good, Tembo. Good morning, madam. How are you? I'm Auntie Dora. Actually, I'm a small entrepreneur. You are speaking very well about tax. I'm just referring to Kamala Market. Honestly, when you come to Kamala Market, a market to be leased by a foreigner for 65 years, and the council who did that, they are sitting in the office. We are suffering to pay rents for 20 something thousand, 10,000 in Zambia in a market, which we can't make it. I think, Mr. Tembo, you are speaking sense. And my prayer is let the government be hearing this. That lease agreement should be reduced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contribution. It's 974 877 You're listening to the Hot Hit Radio program. Uh, we have uh, Pep President Sean Tembo in studio. So if you have a question for Mr. Tembo, is uh, readily available for, you, for him uh, Hello. to answer. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Zimba here calling from Lusaka. Mr. Zimba, please go ahead with your contribution. Mr. Tembo is, is in Mr. studio. Mr. President, Mr. Tembo, how are you, sir? I'm very well. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good, thanks. I, I'm actually following your discussion, and I believe you are the one who is supposed to be in the state house. Because my advice, Mupa Samdala, you know, but you, the way you are articulating things, all right, it shows the management, governance of national uh, resources must understand it and you can do it better. Me, I'm just praying very hard. And I think from now, I think I'm your man. I'll be praying very hard to see my next election the TNT picking up, picking up, one them kind of government so that you can run this country. You, you, you sound very well. You understand these things, Mr. Tembo. Don't stop. Just continue. Continue hitting the nail in its head so that people understand you. Okay. I like it very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Tembo. Thank you, Mr. Please Zimba. Thank you for your contribution. Let's uh, let's tackle those three. I think Mr. Zimba was a compliment to you. Uh, maybe I should pick up one more call and see if we can get a question. Uh, 0974-870-877-0950-955-877. We'd like to hear from you. What's your uh, question? What do you want to ask Pep President Sean Tembo from the discussion we just had? Good morning. Order. Order. Uh, Francis Mungentika is uh, calling you from uh, Lusaka Town. Good uh, morning. Uh, uh, pleasant. Good morning. Uh, Sean Tembo, how are you, Mr. President? I'm very well. How are you, sir? No, could be better. No, we are enjoying you. You are somebody who has proved to be a patriotic Zambian, giving the proper checks and balances. And uh, it's up to those who are being given the checks and balances to follow some of the things you are saying, because you are the voice for the voices. So you are speaking for the people, uh, the things that they are crying out right now, because... You know, when the president comes into government, the first thing, those who are near him, want to show him to be too good for nothing when they want positions, they want to be politically correct. So you tell him the truth, the things that the president doesn't want to hear. And the president, you are new in the office, don't concentrate on the two advising you. Listen to what people like Sean Tembo are telling you. They are the ones that are going to build it. Because if you go in the route of just listening to Malala and who are surrounding you, know what will happen? You close yourself from getting the truth, what the people are talking about. So at the end of the day, Build this country, fix this country the way you promised. At the end of the day, Sean Tembo is there to give the proper checks and balance like other opposition uh, political parties. Now, the issue of taking the thing to, to the state house, uh, there's that uh, organization where the Anti Corruption Commission by, by, by Sean Tembo. Can you comment on that where Anti Corruption Commission begs to be taken to state house? Is it, are, are we not shooting ourselves in the feet? Because those are the same things eh, the UPND were condemning now. They want to do the same thing, take out of the institutions eh, to state house. So why do politicians change once they get to that office? What is it that they see, that they find? Or what is it that they come to discover when they are there, when the language changes, and even the things that they promise to say, oh, 10 hours, eh, eh, I mean, you know, 14 hours, the dollar changes. Why is it that people change around, change, change 360 degrees to just say, no, we need to be given time. Yes, time has to be given, that when the leader does not come to apologize again for making all those pronouncements, we need to hold that leader accountable. So to you, Ashwin Tembo, I'm encouraging you, any stone thrown at you, Pick up the stones that are thrown at you to build a stronger foundation for this country. At the end of the day, you are one of those genuine people that President Lung should even love first before even any of this who are cheating him. 
who are telling him things when a lot of things have been changed, as I conclude. A lot of things that were promised. Believe you me, Rashawn Tembo, how many things have been achieved right now? And how many things every day you hear a minister or somebody or, 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 or an advisor or something saying, no, we need to give him time, you know, we need this and that. Things that they were saying, when I just come in, immediately, this and that will well, Mumbi, we'll so ask you to history. conclude your, your time. Yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. It's uh, 0974-807-7, Let's start with... Uh, Mr. Maimbo. Mr. Maimbo, are you bitter, Mr. Tembo, because of the zeros? <laughs> we are not bitter, not at all. Uh, you know, politics is uh, it's, it's, it's time-bound, um, and your fortunes change. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, uh, HH did very well in the last election is not a guarantee that he's going to do well in 2026, depending on how he actually delivers. And um, for us, uh, we learned our lessons uh, based on our unexpectedly uh, poor performance in the last election. And uh, we are building you know, a stronger foundation to make sure that come 2026, we are better able to sell ourselves. And um, for us, we don't attack uh, President Hichirema. We actually advise him. And uh, the reason we advise him is because we want him to succeed. I know that the chances of him succeeding are very, very low, but uh, we are not going to get tired of advising him because we really strongly feel that he needs to succeed. We feel that the Zambian people suffered enough and um, uh, you know, they need a reprieve. They need to turn a, a new chapter, they need to turn a better page. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we know that if HH uh, succeeds, the Zambian people would have succeeded, and Zambia as a country would have succeeded too. So that is the reason why we take our time to go into the details of actually advising President Ichirema what he has done wrongly, um, how he can do things right going forward. We've always told him th from the word go. Uh, one of the things I told HH uh, the time he was elected a few months ago was that he needed to appoint people who are competent, people who can get the job done. Um, he did not need to fall into the same pit for that uh, former President Rungu fell into by surrounding himself with the uh, surrogates and uh, bootlickers. Uh, we had, uh, you know, President Rungu's uh, ministers boasting to say, me, I'm the number one bootlicker to the president. Uh, so, so if uh, President Ichirema also fell in the same trap, he would uh, end up not delivering to the expectations of the Zambian people in the same manner and fashion that uh, former President Rungu failed. Um, and disappointed Zambians. And for sure, when the appointments started coming out, we saw clearly that uh, this was based on patronage and not competence. Uh, he's uh, trying very hard to appoint um, people who are associated to his business colleagues, people who are associated to you know, former President Manawasa, uh, in the hope that he can replicate uh, some of the success that um, uh, you know, f of former late President Manawasa recorded for this country. But, you know, lightning does not strike at the same place twice. Uh, HH needs to be his own person. He needs to uh, formulate plans for this country based on the circumstances that are there today, not the circumstances that were there when Manawasa was president. So we tell, we advise HH. We don't attack him. Uh, I, I've never attacked HH, actually. I always advise him. Okay. Coming to... Um, Sister Dorothy, Dorothy. yes. yes. Uh, I think she raised a very pertinent uh, issue. Uh, you know, these markets which were built through this um, uh, public-private uh, partnership, I think there's a lot of exploitation taking place there. And uh, it re-echoes my earlier sentiments about these cartels which are there. Mm -hmm. You know this country, um, uh, uh, Peter, there's a lot of exploitation of the Zambian people. A lot of exploitation of the Zambian people. Each and every small thing, Zambians are exploited. Even basic things, you go and buy a packet of sugar, you find that a packet of sugar on the shelf here in Zambia, sugar which we grow here in Mazabuk, is more expensive. When I say more expensive, I don't mean slightly more expensive. I mean very expensive compared to the sugar that the same uh, uh, company exports to other countries. Why should it be like that? Why are Zambians being exploited like that? You talk about all other commodities, cement were exploited. Bread were exploited. This were exploited. That were exploited. Chickens were exploited. Even these shops which were built and which people are renting, Zambians are being exploited. So where are we going to have reprieve? Me, I had the opportunity of living in another country. I lived in uh, Botswana. I lived in South Africa. I lived for about a year in Kenya. 
And uh, I can assure you that uh, governments in other countries out there, they really protect their citizens. They never allow their citizens to be exploited in the manner that we are exploited here in Zambia. But here, you find that uh, government just uh, you know, gives a blind eye to the exploitation of common Zambians, poor Zambians. And that is why I always say we need a president with a backbone, a president who can stand up to these uh, corporates who operate in our economy. Because our economy is not controlled by Zambians. It's controlled by foreigners. Some of them have settled here for a long time, that's understood. Some have even become Zambians, that's understood. But our economy, more than 90% of our economy, is controlled by foreigners. And these people form cartels to exploit the common Zambian. And the government is fully aware of this. But instead of doing something about it, they just receive donations uh, to their chipani, then uh, they turn a blind eye to that exploitation. That needs to come to a stop. There is no way that someone should be paying 26,000 kwacha for that small shop at Kamana Market. And uh, they need to survive. They need to sell there. They need to, 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 to feed their families, take their families to school. You understand? So government needs to intervene. It needs to review that contract and say, you know what, you're exploiting our people. If we need to buy you out, we'll buy you out so that we own this market and have it under IDC so that people can be charged reasonable rates. You understand? So that mm -hmm. is what should be done. But uh, Peter... That can only be done if you have a president with a spine, a president with a spine. And I doubt that HH has a spine. He might have it, but I doubt. Coming to um, Mr. Zimba. Mr. Zimba, okay, Mr. Zimba uh, gave us some compliments, yeah. which we appreciate. It was, it was mainly a compliment. Yeah, yeah. So and uh, coming to the last gentleman, I think, mm. about the movement of uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission and the Drug Enforcement Commission to State House. You know, that's why me, I've always taught the people. People, That's why people think that uh, I attack HH. I don't attack him. I just say the truth about HH. Me, I've always uh, doubted, from the word go, I've always doubted uh, uh, President Hichirama's agenda for this country. He says, and he has been saying a lot of nice things, a lot of niceties. You know, when it comes to fighting corruption, you say that. When it comes to transparency and accountability, you say that. But when you look at the action on the ground, you know, the action on the ground is contrary to the words he preaches about. He doesn't walk the talk. You understand? He says one thing and does another thing. When he was in opposition, he was talking about how he was going to run a transparent and accountable government. But in reality now, he's trying to be obscure himself. Right now, as we speak, we are in the constitutional court because I had to sue him for him to, uh, uh, for his assets to be declared. You understand? And he is... Uh, you know, of course, the matter is in court. But uh, the bottom line is that why should it take, uh, uh, why, why should it take us going to court and wasting the court's time? If he is a president who believes in transparency and accountability, why can't he just do that and save Sean Tembo time, save the constitutional court time? Why can't he do that? The same applies to the issue of um, fighting corruption. The people who will be investigated, the majority of the people who will be investigated by the Anti-Corruption Commission and the Drug Enforcement Commission are people in the executive. The ministers that he appoints, the officials, the permanent secretaries that he appoints, him, HH. So when he has the uh, Anti-Corruption Commission and DEC at State House there, the same place that the people who are supposed to be investigated are, they rub shoulders in the same corridors then how is he going to fight corruption? You can't. Because the director general uh, it will always be at State House there, trying to brief the president, trying to get permission from the president. Can I prosecute that one? Can I prosecute that one? Can I investigate that one? You understand? You can't have law enforcement agencies being controlled by the executive. Law enforcement agencies are supposed to operate independently. Right now, uh, HH was supposed to be proposing modalities of uh, how to uh, divorce the Anti-Corruption Commission and the Drug Enforcement Commission from government. It's supposed to be a standalone independent entity, the way the judiciary is. You understand? So, uh, HH speaks a lot of nice things about how he's going to run a transparent government, how he's going to fight corruption, but in reality, his actions on the ground are contrary to his words. And mm -hmm. the Zambian people are in for a rude shock. And for me, as Sean Tembo, I'm very proud that I told these people, not after HH became president, but way before he became president. And it wasn't based on uh, any dislike I, 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 I might have for HH, no. As a person, I like HH. I think he's a good guy. But uh, I knew that uh, he had very little to offer to this country. He doesn't have the competence, 
and he's not um, you know a straightforward person he's not a person uh, whose word you can take to the bank he's not a forthright person uh, you know uh, president rungu might have been incompetent but uh, he was forthright he used to say it out hh is one of those people who will hoodwink you into believing that uh, he's supporting you but he is actually not supporting you so he even the farmers the way he has treated the farmers he tells the farmers that no we are going to buy your maize we are just looking for grain bags the farmers stay at depots for months instead of kwendo lima ko garauza ku ku maminda kwao kuja ma farmers bali ma depots wa embekeza tundarama tuweza na saving ako they start buying relish ma depots muja for months on the promise by government that they are going to buy their maize then government makes a u turn and say no we've reached the limit that is misleading people if you are not going to do something for someone just tell them in their face and Mr. say Tembo. i'm not going to do this it's 10:30 uh, we have to wrap up um, uh, before we wrap up i have one final question for you how would you rate the european disability to run the economy so far on a scale of 1 to 10 mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah i think if i was very generous i would uh, give them i think 2 out of 10 if i was very generous President Sean Tembo was our guest today on the Hot Seat Radio program. We'd like to thank you very much for uh, you know coming through to the show this morning. Thank you, Peter. It was a pleasure. There you have it. That's our show for today. The Hot Seat Radio program will be back for another exciting edition on Thursday, right here on your hot station number one for news and entertainment. Remember, also live on Kwitu FM or 93.3 FM. To everybody that was watching us live on Facebook, a big thank you to you. Until next time, it's goodbye for now.